Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for December 5th, 2022. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Science DMZ Engagement with the University of Arkansas. Our presenters are Mark Krenz, Kathy Benninger, and Don Durso. Mark is the Chief Security Analyst at Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and the Deputy CISO of Trusted CI. Kathy is the Manager of Networking Research at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and a member of Trusted CI. And Don is Director of Research Technology at the University of Arkansas. Before we begin, I have a couple things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Um, attendants are welcome to ask questions. Um, we're, we're going to kind of chunk up the questions uh, with, the, with each presenter. So if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and type it in, and then we'll try to address it as we transition between uh, speakers. And with that, I want to welcome Mark. Mark, welcome. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about Science DMZ security. And I'd like to introduce Kathy Benninger. Kathy, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. Yes, I am the manager of networking research at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Um, in addition to my responsibilities at PSC, I am as Jeanette, a member of the trusted CI team and also uh, with the NSF Access Operations team. Thank you. Don? Yes, good morning. Um, Don Durso, uh, Director of Research Technology at the uh, University of Arkansas. Our group um, is primarily uh, stationed in the IT uh, services organization, but we're kind of the gatekeepers um, for uh, research relationships with uh, libraries, high performance computing, um, offices sponsored programs, and the security office primarily. Thanks. And I'm Mark Krenz. I'm, as Jeanette said, I'm Chief Security Analyst at the IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, and I'm Deputy CISO for Trusted CI. And there's my email address if you ever need to contact me. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about this presentation and how it came about. So we had an engagement with the University of Arkansas to help build the Arkansas Research Platform. And this was a partnership between Trusted CI and EPIC, uh, who is available at epic.global. Uh, Hans Adelman and Brenna Mead uh, joined us for that. And uh, we put together a uh, paper, which I'll be talking about later, uh, but they also gave us a lot of help and advice and recommendations uh, for helping to make the, the ARP a successful platform. Uh, so just give you a little back, background there. So your scientists may be faced with this challenge. You know, they, they collect a whole bunch of data, maybe terabytes, you know, 500 terabytes of data, and they're ready to upload it to the supercomputer at a university, maybe not their own institution, but another one. Um, and then they find that as they start to transfer this large amounts of data, that they run into the problems that you have with uh, the network topology and maybe buffering and, and deep packet inspecting firewalls, slowing everything down, saying that it's going to take maybe a year, you know, this is the extreme case, but a year to transfer 500 terabytes worth of data. Um, this isn't very in line with the the use of, of science and supercomputers. So science DMZs are a uh, way to, to help uh, mitigate that issue. Um, and science data transfers are kind of their own use case. If you can think of like this, you know, this chart here shows the quadrants of, of use cases. And down in the lower left, we have like the typical, you know, use cases that you see like, um, you know, email, video conferencing, webinars like this, uh, doing website requests and email. And those are more or less real time, you know, like you make a request and you get something back right away. And also they're, they tend to be low, um, low transfer amounts, you know, like just under a gigabyte, probably even megabytes or kilobytes 
uh, of transfer at a time. But these large science data transfers, like I said in the previous slide, 500 terabytes is an awful lot to transfer at once. Um, and they typically are transferred over maybe hours, um, maybe even days or weeks, but can be as little as you know 30 minutes or something like that for a large transfer like that. So you can see how it kind of falls outside the use cases of, of most other, th other things on the network um, because they have different network needs. Um, and here's a great chart that kind of shows uh, according to what your specific need is, like say if you need to transfer one gigabyte in one minute, uh, you can see this, um, I hope you can see my arrow here, but uh, down in this quadrant, anything that's in white shows where that meets the needs of, of the network um, uh, as it's set up. So in other words, if you need to transfer one gigabyte in one minute, you're going to need at least 133 megabits per second uh, of line speed. Uh, anything you know beyond this, you're starting to run into needing 10 gigabits per second, or even greater than you know 10 gigabits per second. So you're going to need some pretty serious equipment. Um, so this is a great chart, maybe to take a screenshot of or, or whatever uh, to see um, to compare with whatever your transfer needs are. And the traditional campus network model uh, maybe is creates a challenging uh, problem for science data transfers because, uh, like that chart showed, it's more suited for the, the transfers of smaller amounts of data and smaller amounts of time. Um, they're typically using, you know, deep packet inspecting firewalls that kind of slow down uh, these large data transfers because they're having to look at the at the packet and try to do some kind of analysis to see if uh, there's some kind of malicious attack going on or whatever. Um, this can slow it down. Also, the multiple levels of uh, the network can slow things down. Uh, things like um, network buffers and host network buffers and, and extra hops that are taken. These all things. Uh, these are all things that can lead to uh, the network slowing down and not going at the line speed that you're expecting. And this is just a nice little XKCD that shows that, you know, even in today's world, we still have problems with transferring large amounts of data over the network. And oftentimes it's easier just to ship somebody a hard drive uh, through a courier. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it along to Kathy. Thanks, Mark. Um, the scenario that Mark described is the driver behind the science DMZ concept. Um, recognizing the unique requirements to, that um, are required to support high performance data transfer in the engineers at Energy Sciences Network, um, it's part of the Department of Energy, uh, created the science DMZ architecture. Um, so, so the idea of the science DMZ architecture is to create a, a high performance um, so-called friction-free data transfer solution. The Science DMZ is based on four key concepts that include an architecture that's specifically designed for high-performance computing and networking. So as Mark mentioned, this means that the network devices and all of the network interfaces um, that are located within the Science DMZ need to be configured with deep buffers of, of appropriate size such that they can handle high-speed, large round trip time, wide area network data flows. These are also known as elephant flows um, in the community and handle those with, with absolutely minim minimizing the, the packet loss. Um, another key concept of the science DMZ, of course, is that it includes the data transfer nodes to, to send in and receive the data. Also part of the science DMZ is uh, some type of network um, performance measurement platform. Um, the majority of these are based on the, the perf sonar uh, uh, software distribution. Um, and uh, the fourth Im important aspect of Science DMZ is the security policy that's, that is appropriately tailored for high performance computing and networking in these applications. Um, so if you kind of look at the, the diagram um, on this slide, uh, some other aspects that it shows that you know, are that um, the science DMZ uh, to be effective and, and kind of minimize the campus network engineering complexity. Um, the science DMZ is built um, at or, or near, very close to the campus external network border. Ideally, the components uh, forming the science DMZ are dedicated hardware infrastructure. 
And another aspect uh, that's demonstrated here is that the Science DMZ is separated from the enterprise and uh, the campus land. Next slide, please. To talk a little bit about the components of the Science DMZ, um, first, uh, the data transfer node. A data transfer node is a server that's um, designed, built, and tuned specifically to be able to handle the large data transfers, which, you know, as Mark said, can be in um, certainly hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, um, very, very large uh, um, files on some of those. Um, important part on the data transfer uh, node software application is that it is not running anything like personal productivity applications, no web browsing, no email server. It's it's purely running uh, the data transfer applications such as Globus or Aspera or, or some similar type of, of high performance uh, data movement tool. Um, also the data transfer nodes are connected to some type of, of local storage, uh, typically RAID and in a lot of cases, uh, then this RAID or uh, whatever platform is used for the storage is also shared directly with the high performance computing resource at the site. So um, the data transfer nodes can form a direct um, direct interface to, to that storage and provide the high performance needed. Next slide, please. So I also mentioned the Perksonar um, data, um, data transfer um, performance network performance measurement nodes. Um, Perksonars are servers that are designed, built, and tuned um, specifically for measuring uh, network performance. There's a Perksonar toolkit software distribution uh, that comes with a variety of, of tools and, and test scheduling. These tools uh, perform uh, such functions as measuring bandwidth, uh, they can measure packet loss, one-way delay, round-trip time, uh, which are all elements that, that you care about for understanding your wide area network data transfer flows. Uh, val additional value in this information is that it can help set expectations for network performance. Um, any of the, the da actual data transfers are, are not the performance of any of those is not likely to exceed what you can see uh, with the perf sonar. Um, also, the perf sonar monitoring will offer indications if there's some kind of um, software, soft failures in the network or or hardware failures. Um, and there's a, a link to more information about the perf sonar platform. And the diagram here shows uh, where the Perfsonar sits in the Science DMC network. Um, additionally, there are there are a number of Perfsonars located at various points in the Internet 2 network, um, the Engineering Sciences ES network, and also at N N sites, which allow performance measurement um, across the path, uh, it, which is valuable. Um, either just for ongoing monitoring or if you're trying to, to debug some sort of problem. Uh, next slide. So now that we've kind of uh, presented the description of the motivation and kind of background to introduce the science DMC concept, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what can appear to be problematic in science DMC architecture description. And um, if you look up Science DMZ, you might come across the statement that security is implemented by policies and techniques that do not include the traditional firewall. Now, that do not is, is my own emphasis, but um, what can happen is, uh, for example, a, a CISO in the organization receives a request from their cyber infrastructure team that um, their site could really benefit from a Science DMZ to improve the, the file transfer performance. So anyone who's unfamiliar with science DMC architecture would start Googling and come across that statement and um, you know, fairly ask, 
Well, it says no firewall. How can I be sure this, this design is secure? So that's a fair question. And as part of um, what prompted Don and his team at the University of Arkansas to seek engagement with trusted CI and our colleagues at EPIC as they were planning the architecture for their NSF CC STAR grant. So um, I'll turn the presentation over to Don to talk about um, his experience and insights. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the work at uh, University of Arkansas Fayetteville was, was primarily to support um, a large EPSCOR grant, um, which had multiple partners in several institutions across the state. And the, the proposed um, platform for doing that engagement is called the Arkansas Research Platform. Um, it's it's a virtual organization, but it requires a participation of multiple campuses, um, primarily UAMS, the medical school, and UA Fayetteville, where the two high-performance um, compute clusters um, reside. So we started off with um, the, the beginning was, well, we need a science DMZ. Let's work at the Fayetteville campus to um, kind of uh, inform and educate all of those involved in the process, the science side, the engineering side, the, the operations side to um, uh, understand the needs and then to uh, essentially work together to uh, develop the plan for um, implementing what we're essentially referring to as a regional science DMZ because we're we're repeating the design at multiple campuses. And so we engaged with um, trusted CI who brought along the, the help of Epoch in, in understanding our needs, um, understanding um, what some of the, the risks were and then identifying um, potential solutions. Um, that was directly related to the science DMZ design. In addition to that, um, trusted CI provided insight in from uh, the, the cybersecurity uh, assessment and understanding, and then also in kind of providing some of the, the basis related to the trusted CI framework and implementing the strategic plan for um, the cybersecurity for the Arkansas Research Platform. So that's that's kind of all in, involved in this engagement. And um, we were able to work with the teams and slightly customize the, um, the traditional design uh, from EPA. And I don't know if you want to change the slide, we can take a look at that. So here, the design was slightly modified from the, the perspective of the, the science DMZ is, is dealing with um, a trusted uh, group, right? And so we, we had trust, trusted paths over the internet to um, network uh, through Aron uh, to reach uh, you know, the science DMZ. Um, and from, from those individuals on campus, uh, that was also a trusted path to be able to um, to access the science DMZ and the data transfer nodes and and move their data to the HPC cluster. And so the the concern um, that we looked for a solution for was related to those coming um, uh, logging in from outside of either of those two trusted areas. And so the 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 idea there. Um, was to put a jump box or a bastion host um, where connections through uh, neither of the two known uh, trusted paths would still be allowed. Um, so a researcher trying to launch his job coming in from Starbucks um, would be able to at least have some, some way to access uh, the, the, the science DMZ and therefore the HPC clusters. And so that was um, ultimately um, presented. Um, and we worked on this design with both UAMS um, and UA Fayetteville engineering and research teams. And so um, ultimately uh, this was uh, approved by our CIO and uh, is now this, the standard for 
um, the science DMZ design for the Arkansas Research Platform. And I don't know if I have the next slide or not, or if it's uh, if it's you can. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so at this point, I just want to ask, are there any questions so far? I don't see any, but people might type. So please continue. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. So uh, thanks, Don and Kathy. So, um, you know, now you have the question, What? why is a traditional firewall not recommended for Science DMZ? Uh, Kathy talked a bit about this. Uh, you know, it's designed for business and personal productivity applications. It's not necessarily designed for these large data transfers and so on. Um, and it's optimized to support many small parallel connections, not a few large long-lived science flows. Um, and then uh, the packet buffering issues come into play as well. So it's really designed for kind of a different use case uh, and, or science DMZs are a different use case that is outside the traditional firewall. Um, but of course, there are many ways to actually secure a science DMZ uh, without, you know, implementing the traditional firewall functionality, but implementing, you know, something like firewall functionality. Um, organizations overall uh, cybersecurity program uh, framework and control set comes into play, you know, making sure that you're extending the reach of your cybersecurity program so it addresses uh, the security needs of the science DMZ and the DTN and, and so on uh, by putting in the normal control sets that you would put in on uh, a host uh, or a, a network switch or something like that, you know, making sure that uh, you're using strong passwords and, and uh, centralizing logging and, and so on um, and reviewing those logs. Um, and then uh, science DMZs are dedicated to data movement, does not run general. So you don't want to just run like a, you don't want to run a desktop uh, on your data transfer nodes. Uh, you you want to reduce them to just the minimal amount of, of services that they need to run. Um, and you only want to, you want to keep them limited to just transferring data from one point to another. Um, so limiting their, their purpose. Um, this quote here from Michael Sinatra. So a security architecture, which allows for better segmentation of risks and more granular application of controls to those segment risks, uh, in the case of the science DMZ, the goal is to limit the segmented risk profile to that of a dedicated data transfer host. So again, limiting it to just what it needs to do. Um, access control lists are what you would use kind of in place of, of the you know, firewall rules that, that limit um, the from and to. So you would uh, lay out exactly where you need to transfer data from and to, you, you know, uh, make a chart or a list of, of the different IP addresses that um, you need to set up access control list for. And you'd say only allow from this IP on this network and, and so on to this uh, data transfer node or to our network only on this port um, using VLANs where, where necessary and uh, so on. So you can really uh, restrict um, you know, whereas a lot of networks are more general purpose and allow people to go to just anywhere they want to, a science DMZ can be restricted heavily to uh, to where it's just only allowing from like one point to another. Um, and that really uh, limits what could be done as far as attacks go. Um, and then even though, you know, they say no firewalls, it is still okay to run like your traditional host firewalls on the data transfer nodes, as long as you keep the rule set small. Um, you know, you can just set up firewall DIP tables, NF tables, or, you know, whatever, like on a Linux host uh, to uh, further limit uh, and restrict uh, what can talk to what. And then use, uh, you want to keep an eye on what's going on. So uh, since it's, uh, you would want to do something like this anyways on your internal enterprise network, you know, have an intrusion detection system, have uh, a network monitoring system in place. You'd want to set up something similar for the science DMZ itself so that you have the visibility into what's going on on your network. Uh, so you could use something like Sericata or Snort for signature-based uh, rule sets, or Zeek uh, would be a good option for, you know, tapping the network and actually seeing what's going across and analyzing the protocols. Uh, keep in mind that if you're going to be doing uh, using Zeek or Sericata with a large um, 
uh, with a network that has very fast uh, network transfers, you need to keep in mind that the uh, the host, the Z coast or the Sericata or Snort host has to be um, of sufficient power to be able to, to do that analysis. Um, and the Z community has a has some great resources on how to how to do that. Um, and then on the individual hosts, like the data transfer nodes, uh, you can set up a HID system, you know, uh, host intrusion detection. So, you know, it's it's looking for who's logging in. It's looking at the, the log files to see who's logging in and from where. Uh, it, you can set up something like Tripwire to see if files get changed, um, Tiger or uh, uh, OSSEC or, you know, one of these host intrusion detection systems will, will monitor the data transfer nodes so you can uh, be alerted when when something uh, out of the ordinary happens. And then uh, your routers and switches can set off, uh, send off their network flow information um, back to a centralized log analysis server uh, so that you can do further analysis, um, you know, making sure that you're only seeing the, the protocols on the network uh, that you think you should be seeing. And then you want to give some thought to um, uh, you know, alert response. So you, you want to uh, think about what you're going to do if you see an anomaly in the in the logs uh, and alert on it, um, whether you're going to want to make this an automated thing uh, so that, um, you know, if it sees something, it actually turns into an uh, intrusion prevention system, you know, it, it, it blocks uh, the traffic, but you want to do that carefully because you can end up with uh, false positives. So you probably want to have a period of time where you're testing this network and testing out the um, the prevention aspect of, of the IDS um, to make sure it's working properly. And then securing the servers themselves. Uh, I, I like this picture. Kathy actually added this picture to this slide. Uh, anybody recognize what this is? Yep. Looks like the door of uh, one of the Apollo pods. Exactly, right. So this is the hatch on a space capsule. Um, and I think it's a great metaphor because if you think about, you know, a science DMZ, it exists outside the protection of the normal um, enterprise network and, and space capsules have to go outside the protection of the Earth's atmosphere, but they still need to allow uh, egress points, right? So the hatch is kind of like that. Um, so uh, on your servers, you know, uh, your data transfer nodes, your perf sonar nodes that are out in the science DMZ, you want to first think about what operating system you're going to use. Uh, Linux hosts are, are used uh, very regularly in science DMZs, probably 90% of the time, 95% of the time. Um, and they're very well battle tested. You know, it's Linux has been running on uh, ex outside the firewall uh, of, of enterprise networks for 30 years now. So the, the problems and, and the risks are well understood there. Um, so it makes a good fit for being used as a science DMZ uh, host. Um, you want to make sure that you use like a long term support release. You know, if if you're going with um, Ubuntu, for instance, you don't want to use the short term releases that only last six months and then you have to do a refresh. Uh, you want to uh, go with the long term release and also give some thought to when uh, a version that you're going to implement will be retired. You know, when is it going to stop having security updates? If it looks like you're uh, the the distribution that you're going to go with is about ready to meet its end of life. You might consider other distributions maybe, or consider waiting until the, the next version comes along. At least have a plan in place for what you're going to do when you do reach that end of life. So you're not running um, unsupport operating systems outside uh, in your science DMZ. Um, and then, like I said, turn off uh, offered services to data transfer application, you know, just limit it to data transfer applications and performance measurement, turn off your desktop, turn off your, you know, uh, web server, printing server, Samba, database servers, unless you really need them. Honestly, this is a good recommendation in general for servers. You don't want to run anything more than you really need to. And one way to check that, there's the command there, uh, the SS, which is the replacement for the NetStat program. Uh, with those options, you can actually uh, see what is listening on your host and then um, 
investigate you know how to shut that down um, security assessment tools are a good idea to run regularly uh, this linus uh, program uh, will give you like a quick assessment and tell you what risk level you're at and what you might need to do to um, reduce that risk level uh, rk hunter which stands for rootkit hunter is one that you could run like on a daily basis or even hourly basis and it'll send you off emails if it detects that there's a rootkit uh, presence somewhere on the system. So these are good tools that you could have in place to be able to um, uh, have more awareness of what's going on and, and try to reduce your risk. Um, additionally, you can, uh, you know, must for 14 of the framework talks about utilizing external resources. And this is a great uh, example of how you can do that by using something like third party vulnerability scanning. Uh, you can check to make sure that um, the software that you are exposing to the network is patched and up to date and doesn't have any uh, known vulnerabilities on it. Um, or maybe you running services and you weren't even aware that they were running. So doing like an Nmap scan or something like that to see what ports are open from the outside uh, would be a good idea. Uh, see what the attacker sees, you know, doing an Nmap scan from uh, the public internet to your science DMZ to be aware of what they would see if they did a similar scan. Uh, Research SOC also offers this vulnerability scanning service, and um, you know they're custom tailored to the science and and research uh, community. Um, and then, in addition to that, there are other you know commercial solutions for doing vulnerability scanning. Uh, Dorkbot is one uh, from University of Texas at Austin, I think, uh, that uh, will do scans of web servers and and so on, and send you emails. Um, Perf Sonar. Uh, you know, they, they make a distribution of Linux that's kind of like install and forget, but you can add additional uh, controls to that perf sonar node to make sure that it's protected because you don't want your perf sonar node to be compromised. And then that's a lateral point that somebody can move from across uh, your science DMZ laterally, because it could be that your perf sonar node has special privileges that, you know, uh, somebody out on the internet wouldn't necessarily have. So you want to make sure that you spend some time uh, securing your perf sonar node, uh, setting up a, a firewall, setting up something like fail to ban. Uh, fail to ban is a software that is basically a service that runs and watches your uh, logs and looks for brute, for brute force attacks and stuff like that. And will uh, add firewall rules to block them and stuff like that. So um you know, there's a lot of great communities here that uh, the Perf Sonar uh, uh, community can help you with with uh, securing your Perf Sonar nodes. And then, like I said before, you want to include your Science DMZ in your centralized log aggregation service so that you're sending, you know, your logs to a centralized uh, point. Uh, for one, to get them off of the host in case the host gets compromised, you actually have a backup of the logs. And two, so that you can more easily monitor what's going on on these hosts and uh, maybe send them off to your log analysis team um, for uh, for detecting problems. Uh, also, you know, use your con normal configuration management tools that you use like Puppet Chef and Ansible to be able to control the configuration and make sure that if you have to reinstall a DTM that it's brought up to speed with the, the standardized configuration that you have at your site. Um, so you can continue to use stuff like that. And then uh, there's a lot of resources available for, you know, when you get to the design, build, and test stages, um, you know, that you want to think about. So the first thing is don't try to reuse infrastructure uh, that you already have. You want to have this be a separate project, really. You want to, you know, maybe uh, start with new hardware if you can. Um, and have it be a separate thing. Don't try to, you know, have like a monolithic host that also does the science DMZ or something like that. You want to have a dedicated infrastructure in place for it. If you're looking for funding on that, NSF uh, has had several times in the past CC Star funding um, that people who are wanting to build science DMZs have taken advantage of. There was just one this year that ended, I think, in June, and there's a link there in the slides, but keep an eye out for additional funding sources like that that you can use to be able to purchase new hardware. 
Um, one thing that I don't think Don mentioned, uh, but that they ran into with the global pandemic uh, causing like chip shortages and everything, uh, you'll want to plan fairly far ahead and talk to uh, your network hardware vendor in advance because they ran into problems where um, they were 52 to 54 weeks out on getting hardware because of the, the back order log and the chip shortages. So if uh, you're needing to get you know, like a, a new switch or a new router or, or so on, uh, you want to start that process fairly early so you can get the orders in so that you actually get the hardware on time um, or at least close to on time. Um, let me see. And then Epic, uh, they've been an excellent resource for helping out uh, institutions to you know, design and do performance measurement on their science DMZ and debugging problems. Uh, they helped us out greatly during this engagement to be able to answer a lot of the low level questions and provide recommendations on how to do stuff based on their extensive experience on this matter. So I would encourage you to talk to Epic early on uh, if you have questions about how to go through the design process and, and the whole the whole process, you know, design, building, and testing. Uh, Trusted CI is here and uh, available for your cybersecurity questions. Um, we have a paper that we published that I'll talk about in a second that has a lot more detail than is in this presentation. And then ESNet is available for um, doing actual testing of data movement. You know, they can make large transfers for you so that you can actually test to make sure that your science DMC is working properly. And then above and beyond, you know, the, the standard stuff that you do, uh, you can look into these kind of galaxy brain techniques, uh, you know, integrating with research socks, sending your, your log files off to research sock, uh, because this is what they do. You know, they're a security operations center that ingests logs from different institutions and, and science projects and analyzes those for uh, malicious activity and then alerts you on them. Um, so that that would be a, a good uh, avenue for um, kind of an advanced thing to look at. Uh, you can also utilize black hole or null routing, um, which is basically where at the uh, your upstream provider, um, you know, like your the, whoever's providing internet access to your uh, campus, uh, they can insert a null route and basically block like a, a malicious actor from even reaching your your border routers and stuff. Um, but you have to be a little bit careful when you do that and you have to uh, test it a lot. So uh, that would be something probably you'd want to talk with Epic about um, or your uh, and your upstream provider definitely uh, before you implement something like that. You can also set up a honeypot uh, decoy host. So these are honeypots if you're not aware of uh, this term. So it's basically a, a host that is sitting on your network for the purpose of being compromised so that you can actually detect that and detect uh, malicious activity on your network. Um, so this would, you know, detect when somebody's doing a network scan, when they're using specific types of attacks, um, maybe even something that's specifically related to DTN related services like Globus um, and so on. And then feeding all this uh, data back to your seam so that you can actually uh, see that it's happening in real time and get alerts on it. Uh, like I said, um, as part of the engagement with the University of Arkansas, uh, Epic, um, you know, um, Nishan Abinit, Hans Adelman, uh, Kathy, Don, uh, myself, and Brenna Mead, we all worked on this paper that kind of pulls together all the different advice on science DMZs as far as security goes and puts them into one paper uh, with additional links in the appendix to all those other resources. So we tried to make this kind of a one-stop shop for uh, learning about cybersecurity, uh, uh, learning about science DMZ security, um, and uh, the, the jumping off points from there. Um, and there's a link there that you can download this from. It's also, uh, we tried to write the paper so that it can kind of be handed to your uh, leadership and they can you can qualm their fears about running a science DMZ by showing them uh, in the first half of the paper, uh, you know, kind of addresses that science DMZ security can be uh, done uh, securely and uh, how to go about doing that. And then the second half of the paper uh, is more boots on the ground recommendations for your actual IT team uh, to go about implementing stuff. So uh, we want to make something that would address both parties. Uh, 
Science, uh, Trusted CI is here to help. Uh, we have a number of resources. We can do one-on-one uh, -on -one engagements and so on. And we have these webinars uh, that are great and, and Twitter feed and everything. Um, Epic also is, is here to help. Um, they recently changed their contact email address and the new one is, is there, but they're available at epic.global. And we've uh, regularly presented with them uh, this presentation, but unfortunately they weren't able to make it this time. Um, but yeah, I would encourage you to reach out to them if you have any questions about implementing a, a science DMC. And with that, I think we can move into questions. Yes, um, we have a, a, a comment here in support of the uh, recommendation, don't use enterprise firewalls for DMZ. Um, our firewall vendor, a major one, even has a pass-through mode uh, specifically for DMZ, but there's a bug in it at the moment which limits the flow rate. Uh, that's not easy to that's not to say whether the advertised non-bug flow rate would have been sufficient for our users anyway. Uh, a user was affected by this limit. So um, there, this person is uh, kind of uh, iterate, reiterating some of your um, statements about firewalls. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And that's one that actually came up during the engagement and Epic talked about a lot. So Epic's had a lot of experience with, with you know, setting up the science DMZs and they've run into the, the marketing talk versus the reality of some of these um, uh, routers and switches that claim that they can handle elephant flows, but maybe not really, you know. So they were, uh, they warned us about that early on. They weren't warned uh, University of Arkansas and so on about that early on. Um, and we put that into the paper as well, you know, that sometimes the marketing uh, team gets a little bit over enthusiastic and, and maybe they haven't fully tested uh, that stuff really does what they claim it does. Um, that being said, there, I guess there's some hardware out there, albeit much more expensive, that can handle some elephant flows. But, you know, you'll want to do some research into that before you just go out and buy something. Um, We've got so. another question here. Um, what are some suggestions when it comes to securing non-local users that want access, uh, visiting researchers, et cetera? We are looking for other methods to complement our um, multi-factor authentication requirement for our login nodes. Right. So that's where we talked about like the, the jump host, the bastion host, uh, people call it different things, but basically you'd have like a, a jump host that would be um, kind of like connecting to VPN or something like that. You know, you connect to the, the jump host first and the jump host maybe is a bit more, uh, it's less restrictive in, in who it allows in. And then from the jump host, you make a connection to the, the actual science DMZ data transfer nodes. That way you have just an additional uh, control point where you can actually monitor people and provide, you know, two-factor authentication and, and so on. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I can jump in there too a little bit, Mark, because the issue comes down to, you know, whether or not you want to give affiliate accounts out um, to all of the, you know, uh, users outside your specific project. So, so that becomes a management uh, decision as well. Um, I think, you know, ultimately some form of either participation in, in common, um, you know, maybe a, a, a better solution but right now you know to uh to mark's point provide that that more secure um and uh, path into your uh to reach your data transfer nodes in science DMZ in general okay we'll good? let them uh oh sorry go ahead mark no i was just gonna say great point then yeah we'll let uh that person reply if they have follow-up questions um how about what transfer tools do you use is it all globus or others so uh, from what I've heard, it's, you know, I mean, it's Globus, uh, it could be um, Grid FTP is one that is gets used. Um, I don't know, Kathy, do you have any, any other tools that you could recommend? Globus is, is probably the most widely used. Um, we've had, we've had um, some interaction with sites that use Aspera. Um, that's a commercial product, so there are costs associated depending on the performance you need. Um, right now, I think we're we're still we're still looking and still open to 
to considering application, other file transfer applications. Okay, we still have some time um, for questions. So I'm going to go over some community updates and give people a moment to type if they still want to ask more questions. Uh, first, our next webinar is going to be January 23rd. Uh, it's on real-time executive for multiprocessor systems, RTEMS. Uh, our presenter is Jader Bloom from University of Colorado, Colorado at Colorado Springs. Uh, also, be on the lookout for USENIC's Enigma 2023 conference. Um, for those of you who are interested, that's going to be January 24th through 26th in Santa Clara, California. And I will be publishing a blog wrapping up all of our presentations from this past year uh, and give people some hints and, and um, topics of, of presentations that we've booked in 2023. And with that, I think we're we're ready to wrap things up. Um, those of you in the audience, uh, does anyone have any more questions? Um, if not, I I think we can call it a call this a presentation a success. So, okay. um, any last minute comments, Mark, Kathy, or Don? I I think there is one more question. So, uh, it was for your Globus setups. Are you placing all your DTNs into a single endpoint for a multi mode setup? Um, uh, Don, maybe maybe you could answer that. Um, yes, we're looking at uh, essentially uh, a couple of uh, separated uh, DTNs. Uh, one is for the the Pacific Research Platform, the work that's being done there. Another is is just dedicated um, for Globus transfers. Um, there's another project um, with UAMS uh, that has. Um, a need for a Spera. And so I believe on their campus, they may put a Spera and Globus on the same server, but we're looking at potentially separating those. D does that answer the question? It's not really set up as a, a, a forwarding agent. I can also speak wearing, wearing my PSC hat that we typically set up two separate uh, servers for DTNs to provide some redundancy. Um, even just in, in situations where we need to take some system downtime and maintenance, we can uh, direct to one or the other. Oh, the person says, thanks, that helps. I have two DTNs and was planning on how to set them up. Good. Okay. Glad glad we could get that uh, addressed. Um, last uh, call for questions or comments from the presenters. I just wanted to say happy holidays and thanks for all for attending. And thank you to my co-presenters, Don and Kathy. The same. Thank you very much to everyone. Yes, likewise. Thank you. Happy right. holidays. Yes, indeed. Happy holidays, everyone. Hope you have nice, relaxing breaks. Um, be on the lookout for updates from me in January. And um, with the ending of this call, um, we I will be hanging up on you all. So, so have a good day. And um, I'll be sending out this video later today. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.